looked like Brother Gene tried to do it correctly. He held up three fingers for the third verse and started singing the fourth verse. I don't know, uh, that's uh, just about the unpardonable sin, Brother Gene. I don't know if, you know, I, I realize Brother, <laughs> Brother Brantley's long-suffering, but... Uh, <laughs> We kid Brother Brantley a lot about that, but we do appreciate him a great deal. Our speaker this hour is Brother Tim Smith. I'm going to be speaking on the subject of broken cisterns. I didn't give him uh, that topic because of uh, the uh, physical shape that he's in. Four years ago, of course, he uh, was in a car accident, which probably uh, all of you realize and did a lot of physical damage to him. Uh, but we are grateful that he is able to make the trip here and able to present the lesson. He and his wife, Rita, and uh, Amanda, and he brought with him one that uh, was baptized, he baptized, what, about three weeks ago? About three weeks ago. And, uh, I'm sorry, Jimmy, I don't know your last name, but uh, Jimmy Lewis. But uh, we're glad that uh, they came with him. He is a 1984 graduate of the Bellevue Preacher Training School. I think he was in around the same time that Daniel Denham, but Daniel Denham was a lot older at the time. Uh, and still is. True. Very uh, much older. <laughs> Brother Tim is one, though, who has stood for the truth, continues to do so. And we are confident we'll continue it in that vein. He also is a good poet, uh, had, writes under the pen name of H.L. Gradowith, uh, but does some excellent work along that line as well. We appreciate him coming and being here, I know that the lesson that he's going to present is one that will be excellent for us on this subject from Jeremiah 2 and verse 13 on broken cisterns. for those kind words and for the invitation to participate another in the good and grand tradition of Bellevue Lectures. I have probably more true friends in this room this morning than I could say about any other room anywhere in the world. Sometimes when you stand for the truth People look at you in a negative way. They say that you don't care, that you're not loving, that you're not interested in helping people, that you don't want to build up, you just want to tear down. That is false regarding this group, this congregation, and you preachers who are in the audience. I'm living proof. You have come to my aid and you haven't gone liberal. You have helped my family through some very difficult times, generously giving of yourselves, asking your congregations to do the same, and we are just without words to fully express 
the depth of our gratitude. I just don't know what to say. I appreciate it. I thank you all. I thank the elders for continuing to shepherd this congregation through very stormy and difficult times and to keep her pointed toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So many congregations, when the last apostasy arose, just followed blindly down the road that leads to destruction, simply because a name, an individual, a famous person, a beloved speaker went down that road. It isn't that frightening. Frightening to think that one person, no matter how popular, in many congregations, has become more popular than Jesus. Jesus ought to be the one that we're interested in serving and no one else. And this congregation remembers that. And so do the congregations that you all preach for. And if they don't, I expect you'll be looking very soon. I can say before you this morning most anything I want. <clears throat> My congregation won't fire me. They can't fire me because there are only two men there and at best it'd be a tie. I'm, I'm not going to vote against me. And I don't think Jimmy would either. I, I hope not. If so, I won't let him date my daughter anymore. So I think we're safe there. I'm so thankful to have them with us this morning. They have to go with me and take me places now, so it's not like they had a choice. But they're smiling. And I hope that they're as happy to be here as I am to have them. I first stepped into this building in 1981. Uh, about six years old, seven years old, <laughs> as I recall, or a little older than that, and I was being shown the premises, getting to meet the people. I didn't know why at the time. John Bradshaw brought me down with his family to visit, just happened to want to come by the Bellevue congregation and just a few months later I was enrolled actually just a few minutes after we got here I was enrolled as a student in the Bellevue Preacher Training School and I, was, I would like to say that they taught us so well that none of us have gone astray but that's not the case they taught us well enough to stay true to the book but some of us found ways to go astray anyhow and that's a shame, but no shame on this congregation because they trained their preachers well and they provided us two years of instruction that have strengthened me and on which I have reflected and drawn strength all over the last years since then. As Michael said, I was a student here from 83 to 85 and I first spoke on this lecture program in 1986 and I'm so proud and so thrilled to have the opportunity to come back here and spend a few minutes talking to you again this morning. The topic assigned is broken cisterns. The scripture text is Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 13. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Jeremiah was preaching here to a wicked and a rebellious people whose hearts were hardened to the truth, whose eyes they had closed, whose ears they had stopped, and who were openly averse to the right. He was not preaching to atheists. He was not preaching to agnostics or pagans or some pre-Christian form of denominationalists. He was preaching to those who were at that time the people of God. He was preaching to the church of the Old Testament. And yet these words that he used were so pointed, and so straightforward, and I can just hear it now, some people today, they were so negative, and they were so harsh, and they obviously showed that he didn't love them like he ought to love them. Right? Everything up until that last thing. What these words show us is that both Jeremiah and the God who inspired him loved those people. They loved them enough to give them the plain, straight truth. And if we love the congregations among whom we labor today, 
we'll give them the same thing. Just like Jeremiah did. Have you ever had a controversial subject that you were going to have to preach on or address? And you got up the morning of the lesson and you knew what you were going to preach? I hope. And you went to the church building and you were sitting in your 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 little study there waiting for people to get there. Were you afraid? Were you afraid that they might not accept it and be lost? Or were you afraid that they might not accept it and fire you? You see, it's okay to be afraid for the first part. But I'm not sure we ought to be at all concerned with the results of our sermons as far as our, they bear on our employment. Love them enough to say what's right and then care whether they're going to be lost when it's said and done. Give them the opportunity to do the right thing. The Lord used many illustrations to drive home His point to His hard-hearted and hard-headed people. The one used for our title, Broken Cisterns, being in that number. As the historical information is well established elsewhere, both in the book and no doubt in these lectures, we're not going to spend time this morning setting the stage. We're going to just ask that you recall what the others have said and what you already know about the place of the prophet in history and the things that led up to this my text. And note with me that the Jews were here in charge with two evils. They turned their backs on God and they trusted in a false religion. They forsook God, the fount of living waters, and they put their trust in a vessel that was designed to contain or hold water, and yet that vessel was broken. They could clearly see that it was broken and that it would not hold water, and yet still they trusted in it. And we have that same thing to deal with today. People can see that when the Methodists threw that program away, it was because it didn't work for them. But they think we still need to give it a try. And they see that when the other denominations, besides the Methodists, not besides us, besides them maybe, but when the other denominations besides the Methodists tried something and threw it away, it was because it didn't work. And yet they say, let's give it a go anyway. Why? Well, they're much like the people of Jeremiah's day. They've got their cistern, and they look at it, and they see that it's broken, and that it doesn't work, whether it's right or not, and they say, give us some anyway. Maybe they want to be like the nations round about them. These people trusted in false gods. They forged their own way, not the Lord's. They established their own religion based on their own authority, and in many other ways left the only true religion headed by the only true God who alone could actually translate that religion into salvation. May we never forget that the point of the, of the whole idea of religion is not just to make us religious. It's to make us right religiously. And it's not just about being right, but it's about being a part of a religion that Jesus Christ will translate from this world to a better place in the world that is to come. At all costs, we must avoid the errors of the Jews of Jeremiah's day. Let us spend the time allotted us this morning considering religion, both true and false, with a view to avoiding the pitfalls of Judah of old and practicing the religion nourished by the fountain of living waters we begin with true religion. It's oft discussed in and defined by the Scriptures. I like Deuteronomy 10 and verse 12. And now Israel, what doth the Lord require of thee? But to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in His ways, and to love Him, and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul. That's not hard to understand, is it? The words aren't big. The sentence isn't that long. You don't need a picture. True religion begins with obedience, proceeds with continued obedience, and in all ways at all times is sincere. There's no place for a person, as we'll note later in the lesson, unless that mean Brother Hatcher comes up here and cuts us off. Better get it in now, hadn't we? I noticed Brother Douglas was just getting warmed up when he got up here and made him stop speaking. I felt sorry for you, to be honest with you, Daniel, coming up there like that. 
I'll get you one of these, he'll leave me alone. <laughs> Back to the lesson. <laughs> now let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Let us fear God and keep His commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. And yet we are admonished today. We are being admonished. Brother Denham's admonishing right back. A man right now on one of the preacher's lists who's arguing that you not only don't need to, you'd probably better not try to do anything in order to get saved or stay that way. Why? Why is it that they can't understand what doth the Lord require of thee to fear the Lord thy God and to walk in His ways? Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments. James 1.27 Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep Himself unspotted from the world. Those are all things that I must do. I must visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction. I must keep myself unspotted from the world. I must participate by actively obeying the Scriptures if I want to go to heaven. Now you can call that whatever you want to. James calls it pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father. We have many examples of piety to which we may turn for inspiration. For example, we can look to the life of Enoch and see what a dedicated and devoted man he was and what a reward God handed down as a result of it. Enoch walked with God, Genesis 5.24, and he was not, for God took him. What about Noah? He was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God, Genesis 6 and verse 9. Jabez in 1 Chronicles 4 and verse 10 called on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that thou wouldest bless me indeed and enlarge my coast, and that thine hand might be with me, and that thou wouldest keep me from evil, that it may not grieve me. And God granted him that which he requested. What a wonderful thought. Jabez wanted what was right, and God gave it to him. You ever wanted something that was wrong? At first you thought it was right, and you didn't get it. And then you hoped it was right, and you wished it was right, and then you learned that it wasn't, and you got in line with what the Lord would rather you be doing, and that is simply obeying the Word and not worrying so much about the circumstances in which you find yourself. I've talked with people down through the years that you let something bad happen to them and it's God's fault. You let something good happen to them and it's, it's their good. They're the ones, oh, they might say, Oh, we sure thank the Lord for that. But they say it in a hurry and in passing, you know, kind of quiet. But you let something bad come their way. Why, oh, why did God let this happen to me? As though they're suffering something no one else has. And they lose their faith, whatever that means. How do you lose your faith? But they, they lose their faith. Why? Did something happen to them that was worse than the old rugged cross? That was an offense against the Father as well as the Son. It was an offense against all that's good and holy and right. It was the unjust killing of the only perfect being this world has ever seen or shall ever seen. see. <laughs> Sorry about that. You know, it's the first mistake I've made in years with my grandma. I know none of you have that problem, so I'm embarrassed. And yet God didn't look down on the world and say, you know what? They killed my son. I don't love them anymore. He looked down on the world and said, now if you'll come to me through my son, I'll still give you eternal life in the after a while. Why is it that some bad thing can happen to us and so often so many people are willing to just throw the Lord out. Why did God let this happen to me? Look at Jabez. Look at Hezekiah. He wrought that which was good and right and truth before the Lord is God. Second Chronicles 31 and verse 20. Look at Job. We often talk about the patience of Job. I just want you to look at the, the book of Job and see if your troubles measure up against his. There was a man in the land of us whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright 
and one that feared God and eschewed evil. And brethren, when Job went through the worst that this world can offer, he was still a man who was perfect and upright, one that feared God and eschewed evil. Why? Because his religion was true. His religion was right. Remember Daniel chapter 6 and verse 10? I've been in situations not exactly like this, but the point I'm going to make is the king made up a rule saying that you can't pray to anyone but me and my gods for a certain period of time. When the king made that rule, what's the first thing Daniel did when he learned the law was signed? He went right to his room, opened the windows as was his custom, bowed down on his knees and bowed his head and prayed to God. Maybe he wouldn't have prayed there under other circumstances, but there was one day he wasn't going to miss his prayers because he knew that someone in this world was trying to take seniority over God and he was going to have none of it, not even for a little bit. Oftentimes through the years, I've kind of had my hand forced on things from time to time. I've had to say or do things that I wouldn't normally have said or done simply because some well-meaning but ignorant as dirt brother or sister got up and made a rule that would have put me in a position of compromising the Word unless I opposed that rule. There are so many things that could be matters of opinion if people just wouldn't make rules about them. There are so many things that we could get along on. Yes, even agree to disagree on if people just wouldn't make a rule about it. What time do you start services here? Nine o'clock on Sunday? Nine o'clock. That's good, isn't it? There's nothing wrong with nine o'clock. Some places start at ten. What if all the nine o'clocks got together and withdrew fellowship from all the ten o'clocks because they like nine o'clock better? You see, so often brethren divide over silly things, not over that. You know what time we start? When I can get freed up. <laughs> When you have church in your dining room, you're kind of flexible. <laughs> so unless we've got visitors coming, we just start and we get everybody in the, living, in the dining room in there. Look at Anna, Luke 2.37. She was a widow, 84 years old. Departed not from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. Nathaniel, behold an Israelite indeed in whom is no guile. John 1.47. Jesus did always those things that please God. John 8, 29. There's Cornelius and Barnabas and Ananias and Timothy and the list could go on and on. If you want to find an example to inspire you on to fidelity in difficult times, you have but to open this book. It's there. The story that will give you the strength you need to make it is there. No matter what troubles you're facing. Sincerity is a requisite mark of true religion. Indeed, insincerity is the antithesis of all that's true with respect to religion. In Joshua 24 and verse 14, we take a good example when we follow this. Now therefore fear the Lord and serve Him in sincerity and in truth. Fear the Lord and serve Him in sincerity and in truth. Mean it. Don't do it if you don't mean it. And you can't mean it if you don't understand it. So learn it and then live it and mean it with all of your heart. We sing beautiful hymns before and after lessons and in, in all of our assemblies, practically speaking. Mean those words. Think of it. If you think about the words just to the songs that we sing, if you would avoid being a hypocrite, you're just you, you know, we're going to be busy just living our song books every week, aren't we? Mean them. Really live those words. Some people think that the only part of worship that is an active part for them is the singing because someone else leads the prayers and someone else speaks at the Lord's Supper and the contribution. Someone else delivers the lesson. You're as busy as I am right now if you're doing your part this morning. You're studying with me. This is not a lecture that I'm just presenting this is a lecture or a sermon that we study together. You study. Yours is the silent part. Mine is the talking part. But we're all participating. And we all mean it. And we all are in sincerity and truth seeking to serve God better. 
in the time we have left than we have in the time now past. Sincerity. 2 Corinthians 1.12 For our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we have had our conversation in the world and more abundantly to you word. If you're following along in the book, I'm skipping down to the second point now, false religion. False religion and its many and varied manifestations is characterized by, in the first place, ceremonialism. So often the Jews of Jesus' day were more interested in the ceremony than anyone about whom the ceremony should have revolved. In Mark 7 and verse 4, Jesus said when the Jews in the first century came from the market, except they wash, they eat not, and many other things there be which they have received to hold as the washing of cups and pots, brazen vessels and of tables, and there's nothing wrong with cleanliness. I don't know whether it's next to godliness or not, but it's certainly good. And if I'm at your house eating supper with you, I want your plates to be clean. At least the one you set before me. I want you to wash your hands before you dip out the green beans. <laughs> I really want you to use a spoon. But if you can, at least wash your hands. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. It's when we place those ceremonial things above the purpose for our assembly. I always think of, of the first time I met a certain man out at McClellan many years ago. I think all of them have passed away now. Went to his house and, and uh, the man who took me, I think I told this before, that's all right, just smile and pretend like you've never heard it before and, and humor me. Okay, and I went in and the man who took me is John Bradshaw, for those of you who knew him, said, now this woman's going to offer you some angel food cake and some milk. Whatever you do, don't turn it down. It'll offend her. And so we went in, and sure enough, we got in and sat down. She said, won't you have a piece of cake? And I looked, and that place was filthy. I mean, the table was grimy. And she set a plate down that if it had ever seen soapy water, it had been so long ago it forgot it. And, you know, I was thinking, I don't want the, you know, I'm not sure I can eat off that plate. But, but I said, yes, ma'am. And she said, would you care for some milk with that? And of course you have to say yes, because he already told me, and I was 18, and he was older than Brother Tim way back then. <laughs> so I had to do it, and then she brought out a glass that used to be clear, but it was kind of greasy and, and was just nasty. And she, she poured it full of milk, and she set it over there, and I thought, Oh, that this woman were a Jew. <laughs> she did. She did at least wash. But, but you see, the Jews were more interested in that than there were anything else. Ceremony. Now, therefore, why tempt you God? Acts fifteen ten. Put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. Stand fast, therefore, Galatians five one, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Then, of course, Colossians 2, 20-22. These and other passages point up the fact that even the old law wasn't about ceremony. It involved ceremony. Just as the New Testament involves us doing certain things every week. Every week, someone's going to prepare the communion. But they're not going to get a better seat in heaven just because they prepare the communion, are they? And every week we're going to offer the Lord's Supper. We're going to sing a song probably that has to do with it shortly before the Lord's Supper. Someone's going to say something about it. They're going to offer a prayer over the bread and over the fruit of the vine. But the worship and the Lord, none of that is about what you're doing, but what it means. Well, you've got to do it right. Don't get me wrong. But doing it right is not why we do it. And all too often people think, if I just get the externals right, then no one can prove that I'm wrong. You're almost right. No one this side of heaven can prove that you're wrong. But then no one this side of heaven really matters when it comes to whether you're right or wrong. False religion is characterized by false professions. 
the revised version of Proverbs 26, 23, fervent lips and a wicked heart are like an earthen vessel overlaid with silver dross. It's still made out of dirt, isn't it? You may cover it with silver, but it's still dirt on the inside. And you may dress up with many pleasant platitudes. You may pretend with many outward professions that you're what you ought to be or that I'm what I ought to be. But God knows whether our heart is but an earthen vessel or whether it's what it ought to be. Can we forget Matthew 7, 21? Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because not everyone's going to do the will of God. Mark 7, 16, Well hath Esaias prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in Titus 1, 16, they profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him. False religion is characterized by legalism. Raise your hand if you've never been called a legalist. <laughs> never? You such a never? Never have. You're a legalist. <laughs> You're a legalist. Now you have a Pharisee. Okay. Legalism. What is it? Does it make you a legalist if you do what the law says? Because I know it makes you a lawbreaker if you don't. So if it makes you a legalist for doing it and not doing it as lawbreaker, then legalist must be a good thing in some sentences. But not like the Jews of the first century, not like the Pharisees of the first century. They again were more interested in the law for the sake of the law. They were more interested in not only the law itself, but making up their own rules. I don't have the reference with me. I should have looked it up. One that always impressed me was the one about carrying a bucket of water from the river back to wherever you were going to ceremonially be cleansed with that water. you remember what the rule was? If while you were carrying it, some of the water sloshed over the side of the bucket and hit the, uh, the ground, you had to throw the water out and get a clean bucket because the germs from the ground could swim upward and contaminate the water that was in the bucket while you were carrying it. Where's that in the Old Testament? It's not, but it's in the writings of the rabbis. <laughs> That's legalism. When they took the symbolic requirement, it was a requirement, but the symbolism was important, of clean water, and turned it into something ridiculous, something foolish. And when we take God's straightforward, simple requirements for our lives, and so add to them and alter them and amend them and put the little asterisk by them until no one can understand them like the antis do, like some others do, then we have in essence become the Jews of the first century. False religion is characterized by a love of making rules. False religion is characterized by sanctimony. Oh, look at me. How holy I must be. I have a coat and tie on this morning. That makes me better than those who don't, right? Of course not. I have a coat and tie on, therefore I must surely love Jesus. Show me the connection. Not really one, is there? I'm not saying you shouldn't wear a coat and tie. Wear one. Oh, we need a coat in the deep south this time of year, don't we? <laughs> I'm telling you. Nothing wrong with it, though. That's fine. Wear one. But understand that the wearing of the coat doesn't make me or anyone else holier than thou, closer to God than anyone else. It's not about outward appearances. And I'm so thankful. I'm grateful. Some of you aren't as pretty as some of the rest of us. Well, I at least included some other people this time. In Isaiah 58 and verse 2, Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and forsook not the ordinance of their God. They ask of me the ordinances of justice. They take delight in approaching to God. They liked looking religious. That was the point. But their heart was not right. Pharisaic separation, Isaiah 65, 5 which say, Stand by thyself, come not near to me, for I am holier than thou. Listen to what God says. 
These are a smoke in my nose, a fire that burneth all the day. He doesn't like those kind of people either. He knows what they are. He understands that they're just in it for what good it can do them. Matthew 6, 5, When thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. For they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. If your religion this morning is just so people can see what a great man or woman you are, then you have your reward. Your battle is done. And you might as well enjoy the rest of your life here because unless there's a change in your heart, it's the only enjoyment that you're going to get. I don't know, right? Even before I doubt I could run through all of this, I'm just going to skip over the third point now. There's great inconsistency in false religion. And at its best, at its very best, it is of but little comfort in this world and no use at all in the next. False religion is subject to inconsistency and it makes us inconsistent. Consider Matthew 7, 3. Why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Think about it. Others see in us an ability to pick out what's wrong with you, but not what's wrong with me. They understand when we get to a point that we're not subject to the same rules that we would impose on other people. And it's wrong. Luke 6.46, Jesus, very plainly, Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? I think that's a beautiful question. Why do you say that I'm the ruler and sovereign of your life when I'm not? A lot of people think Jesus is Lord. It means that this is, it's like some sort of honorary title that they cast upon Jesus. It's not. It means something. It means that we're actually governing our lives by His authority. He is our sovereign while He's our King, our leader. Romans 12, 1, Thou therefore that teachest another, teachest not thou thyself? Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? What was his point? False religion lets you say and do not. True religion requires both saying and and doing. It requires obedience to the same standard today that was set in the first century. Titus 1.16 They profess they know God but in works deny Him. James 2.15 and 16 If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, more of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled. Notwithstanding, ye give them not those things which are needful to the body. What doth it profit? I'm thankful that my brethren came to my aid as we've come to the aid of so many others down through the years. And if you ever hear someone criticize the, the brothers and sisters among whom we live our lives and, and preach the gospel, those who are holding to the truth because they don't love or take care or aren't charitable enough, have them call me. Have them call me. Because it's just not true. Inconsistency brings reproach upon the cause of truth. Second Samuel twelve fourteen. Howbeit, because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. Nehemiah five nine. It is not good that ye do. Ought ye not to walk in the fear of our God, because of the reproach of the heathen our enemies? In other words, when our religion is false, whether we're on this side of the lectern or that side, the world rejoices. And the enemies of the truth, they are encouraged and given new hope when we do things that are not right in the sight of God. What have we to learn from the false religion condemned by Jehovah so long ago? Is it not that it was wrong then to follow anyone but God? And it's just as wrong today to follow anyone but God? What? or who stands now between us and him with whom we have to do. 
May that be the last thought of our day and the first thought of the next morning, every single day of our lives, making sure that the right King is on the throne, the right Lord is exerting His influence over our lives. And I thank you for your kind attention. Most of you stayed away. Very pleased with that. Even at home, I don't get that. <laughs> God bless you. Thank you, brother.